it, it's kind of been an experiment for me. I would say about six years ago, I just kind of consciously made this decision to try to share as much as I can, um, just to see what happens, you know. And so, I, I, I consider Twitter kind of like my stream of consciousness. Like any thought that comes to my head, I kind of just put it down and so goes. And I definitely sometimes do feel that I'm burdening people with a sense of kind of oversharing, and maybe it is too much. But the more I think that, the the crazier results I get. You know, like this opportunity to speak with you or conferences I've been asked to talk with or, you know, down in um, UWA where Jim Groom works and Martha Burtis, like I became the subject of a student's um, project where they were researching identity and they kind of stalked me online for um, a couple of weeks. So all these crazy things just keep happening. So I guess my philosophy is just to kind of put everything out there um, and see what comes back. And in the last six years of doing that, I've made just these tremendous relationships with people um, who originally I just really admired. And now I'm like working and talking with them, um, yourself and people like Alec and Howard Rheingold and, you know, Bonnie and Tim Lauer and all these people who six years ago, I just kind of looked and read and was like, oh, who are, you know, these people seem so, I don't want to say smarter than me, but so much, you know, more in tune than me who had more experience. And now suddenly just by opening up, I'm kind of, you know, moving in those circles. And it's just really interesting because it's not in a, it, it just feels like it's in a very authentic way. Um, just one example, like Howard Reinhold, for example, you know, I've been following his tweets and reading his work for a while, but now on Instagram, we're just kind of sharing back and forth um, little comments on, like, you know, he likes a picture of my daughter or he's from Marin County where I grew up. And so he keeps posting things from Mount Tamalpais, which is an area where I really, um, really find it's a special place. And so you just keep making these really strange connections. And for people who don't have the connections, it's really hard to explain how kind of authentic and powerful they are. Um, but none of those things could have been possible if it wasn't for me just sharing every part of my personality. I think if I was just sharing things like, you know, here's top 10 ways to use an iPad in a classroom, or, you know, here's this great post on some ed tech topic, I never would have found this diverse of a group of people. By authentically sharing as many parts of my personality as I can, I have developed this really diverse and deep um, network of people. I guess as a teacher, you know, the, the most terrifying thing that we all have in the back of our head is that a parent of one of our students or uh, an employer is going to, you know, take offense to something we say and or think publicly. And so there's always that kind of boogeyman in the back. And so whenever I do, you know, I try not to, I think I was a lot more aggressive when I started and either I'm just getting older and calming down a little bit, but anything political usually would make me a little bit nervous. Um, um, again, religious stuff that I, I stay away from, but those types of things always just kind of freak me out. But as, in terms of privacy or sharing personal thoughts and stuff, there's really been nothing. And I think the more I, I am involved in these communities, the calmer I've become. Like, cause I've become more aware of that, that I, I don't try to be the lightning rod as much as I, I used to be when I first started. And I don't need to make kind of brash statements. Um, and I don't know how that's become, how that's come to be that way. But so, yeah, I would say political stuff is stuff that I'm worried about. Yeah. As you were talking about all that stuff, I just thinking like the, the ideas of humor and vulnerability and silliness. I mean, that's also the cornerstone of my pedagogy, you know, like that. So it goes back to the kind of idea of learning and that's the kind of teacher I am in the classroom. Um, and so I think you can see that as you observe teachers and how they interact with their students as well, right? A lot of teachers are very guarded and very kind of have that distance even in real life with their students because they expect that kind of excellence and, you know, they use words like academic rigor and stuff like that to mask it, but ultimately they want the best. And so I would say for my pedagogy, that's not what I'm looking for. I want that relationship and that connection with my students to be open and silly and honest and vulnerable. And I want to see the messy stuff that they do. You know, I want to see their learning. I want to see them going through the motions, not necessarily a final product. So it goes back to that kind of process over product pedagogy. And so if you're thinking that way in the classroom, I think it's easier to be able to think that way in social media or vice versa. Um, and, you know, the, the most success I've had with kids and, you know, they tell me years later, ironically, on social media after they're not in my class anymore is, hey, your class was a place I felt like I could be myself. Your class was a place that there wasn't that much expectation to, you know, always get it right. 
And I think that's the kind of environment where we learn and best. You know, if there's always that pressure to be the best and to excel and be a certain type of person, um, at least for me personally, that's not how I learn.